The Dharma, incomparably profound and exquisite, is rarely met with even in hundreds of thousands of millions of kalpas. We now can see it, hear it, accept and hold it. May we realize the true mind of the Tathagata. Today is the seventh and final day of this seven-day sashin here at Mountain Gate in northern New Mexico. And it looks like spring might be coming again. It's kind of hard to tell. Uh, according to my, my weather station, it says it's raining. However, when you look out the window, it's not, but it is cloudy. And the temperature at the moment is 54 degrees. So that's a, a nice change from 27, which it was uh, not so long ago. And I'd like to share with you something of the Dzogchen teachings in the Tibetan Buddhist uh, tradition. Earlier in Sashin, I shared some of the Mahamudra teachings and I said as well that both Mahamudra and Dzogchen are the teachings in the, in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition that are most similar to Zen. And this is from a really stellar book that uh, speaks really to the ground of being. It is titled, You Are the Eyes of the World, and it's a translation of a text, a commentary by Lon Chempa, who was a very highly regarded uh, Tibetan Buddhist Dzogchen master uh, centuries ago. And his uh, commentary is on a much earlier text, uh, perhaps the, the first Dzogchen text in the Tibetan tradition. You are the eyes of the world. The actual text is called The Supreme Ordering Principle in the Universe. And this is a commentary on that. In the introduction, it speaks of the spiritual quest. Our experience of life is in large part determined by our conditioned belief system. We believe in certain things, cherish particular hopes, entertain specific fears, and generally point ourselves in some direction based on this focus. And this is exactly what the Buddha had said when he came to his, his awakening. He said, wonder of wonders, all beings possess this profound mind of clarity and wisdom to which I've just awakened. But because the minds of men and women are turned upside down through conditioned belief systems, they fail to perceive it. And our practice really is about a combination of seeing increasingly deeply to the point where we do awaken to that ground of being, our true nature, and at the same time, we are uncovering clarity in terms of why we're not seeing it. Our caught places, as uh, an old Buddhist friend of mine is want to say, are stuck places places where we're blinded to that profound liberating truth because of our ideas, our assumptions, and so on and so forth. And that said, we don't want to cast everything out. However, it's important to see the role they play in determining how we perceive life, how we perceive particularly ourselves, such as ourselves are, and when we can dive deeply enough, it takes a long time normally and a lot of work, but it is so worth it to uncover the experience of that ground of being. It makes a big difference. It is freeing. And we innately sense that. Otherwise, we wouldn't be drawn to practice or fortunate in being drawn to practice because 
we then have the motivation to work, to do the work, to uncover this experience called awakening, enlightenment, Kensho, whatever you want to call it. And as we've said so many different times, it's not something that normally takes place in one fell swoop. It's a process. And we gain greater and lesser insights the more we persist in our practice. And the fundamental practice here is the extended out breath, tuned into as fully as possible and extending that out breath far enough out that everything else has to be let go of. And it trains our mind, it literally trains our brain to not be as invested in the yada yada that constantly plays through our, our mind, through our, our daily life. As we go more deeply into that practice, we do experience moments of increasing spaciousness, clarity, peace, freedom. And then of course, the waves of delusion come rolling right back in and, and we have to work some more. It takes time, it takes effort to reach a point where we are solidly experiencing it. Hakuin, as you've heard so many times, the great Zen master Hakuin, who single-handedly reinvigorated Rinzai Zen in Japan in the 18th century, spoke of having had 19 major Kensho experiences and countless minor ones. And it wasn't until he was in his 50s and he started practicing when he was a kid that he finally had the, the, the deepest Kensho that really freed him up in an ongoing manner. It is our birthright to experience this level of opening. This is why we brought ourselves here, to sit with aching knees, aching back, frustrations that come up in our mind uh, for these seven days. And it is transformative. The more we put into it, the more, I wouldn't say the more we get out of it, uh, except perhaps to say the more we get out of our own way and it makes a difference. And obviously the more Zen practice you can do, the more completely this, this depth increases and the more rapidly it increases. But it's important not to have a, a fixed idea of how long it will take or what you need to do. Kefloroshi admitted that when he went to Japan uh, heckled by his uh, fellow students at Columbia University when they were uh, learning about Zen and Japan from D2 Suzuki, that he was ready to go to Japan, get Shen Kensho, and run back to the United States. He also said many times that if he hadn't burned all his bridges in the United States before he left, he wouldn't have stuck it out. It takes real commitment to reach the place that we can reach that is expressed in this book. But we will not be disappointed if we do. We have to be willing to be in it for the long haul and not to have any, any stated uh, time frame. It's also important to recognize that we human beings are so uh, accustomed to, we're taught to get feedback on where we're at. We get grades in school and we put in a, a, a paper in our, in our college course and, and it, get, it comes back marked up with A, B, C, D, F. We get feedback in terms of our efforts. But in Zen, we're flying blind. Our teacher is able, of course, to see where we're, where we're at 
and to, to nudge us in a direction or say, wait a minute, you're, you're heading down a blind alley here. You might want to back out and work in this other way instead. But in general, even as much as we want to know whether we're making progress, whether we're on the right track, uh, we're not get, going to get much feedback in that direction. So we have to go on faith, faith and determination. And all of that fueled by this need to know, need to return to what we sense we've lost contact with. And with those three pillars of Zen, as they're sometimes called, we have everything we need to keep going to keep going and keeping going is vital. So here, although we're on the seventh day of this Sashin, the final day of this Sashin, I hope and pray it's not the final day of your practice because if it is, you're selling yourself so painfully short. Our practice will, will vary. It'll go up and down. Sometimes we'll feel really like we're accomplishing something. Other times it will feel like we're out in the wilderness dealing with wild animals and, and all manner of other distractions. But don't assume that that means the practice is not working. Because it could be even more effective. The work we do, trying to focus the mind, working on extending the out-breath in the midst of all that chaos, in the midst of fear, in the midst of frustration, in the midst of a wish to flee as far as we can to the farthest corners of the earth to get away from this. As we persist even in the midst of that, something deep is at work and ultimately will be liberating. And not only that, while we're in these difficult mind states, it can feel like we're there forever. But everything changes, including the nice mind states. So we can give ourselves a great deal of benefit if we just sort of look at whatever mind state there is and seek What's beneath it? What about this ground of being? Who are we really? Where did we come from before we were born? What's going to happen when we die? In that way, your practice will con continue to go deeper and deeper and deeper as long as you work in that way. The teachings in this text advise us to relax our focus and allow the wider perspective of total openness to flood through us and light our world from within. This openness may be as simple as being alone and quiet at peace, although that won't do it in the long term. You still have to have this practice to nudge, nudge us deeper. The openness may, is, may be as simple as being alone and quiet at peace. When we are able to relax like this, the energy we invest in maintaining our usual focus is released, freed into its natural condition. And that's what happens when we do yaza even though we're tired. When our mind is really tired, we don't have the energy to keep up the charade, to keep up that parade of of distraction. We more easily go into that open openness of focus and we can sink more deeply into it. So don't don't be betrayed by whether you think that feeling sleepy or tired means you need to go to bed. It might mean that, but it also might offer an opportunity to relax that focus and sink deep. 
I should say also that that's, that's not the end. That relaxed focus, that, that awareness is not, it's not, you haven't reached the ground of being yet. It's a nice mind state, but it's not home free yet. In the process of letting go of a specific focus, however, we tend to let go of one thing only to replace it with another, something we believe to be more true or perhaps more spiritual. This is spiritual materialism. When we become caught in the external trappings of a religion, we fail to penetrate to the heart of its spiritual meaning and actually live it. So, here it speaks to the play of experience. All experiences and life forms cannot be proven to exist independently of there being a presence before your mind, just like a lucid dream. And the text reads, all that has, all that is has me, universal creativity, pure and total presence as its root. How things appear is my being. How things arise is my manifestation that is the manifestation of universal creativity, pure and total presence. Sounds and words heard are my messages expressed in sounds and words. All the capacities, forms, and pristine awarenesses of the Buddhas, the bodies of sentient beings, their habituations, and so forth, all environments and their inhabitants, life forms, and experiences are the primordial state of pure and total presence. All that is experienced and your own mind are the unique primary reality. They cannot be conceptualized. They cannot be conceptualized according to the cause and effect systems of thought. Investigate your mind's real nature so that your pure and total presence will actually shine forth. Investigate your mind's real nature so that your pure and total presence will actually shine forth. And we do that through extending the out-breath with that innate perplexity, that need to know, and to the full bodily experience, energetically, of extending that out-breath. And when things come up, depending on what they are, how strong they are, They're normally just relegated to the, the category of distractions because we are so accustomed to filling our minds with thoughts, with things, with fragments of speech, with bits of verse and bits of music. And what does it do? It makes us feel like we exist. And one of the things that can happen as our mind begins to quiet down and become more silent and we have spaces between thoughts, fear can come up, anxiety can come up. Are we going to disappear? Are we going to die? Are we going to go somewhere and never be able to come back? A little like ancient mariners who feared going outside of the sight of land. They were afraid they'd fall off the edge of the earth. They were afraid they wouldn't be able to find their way back. And something similar can happen to us as we're beginning to do our, our practice and getting it deeper and reaching those moments when we do have space between thoughts. If that happens, when that happens, see if you can't tune in and stay present with that fleeting moment before it turns two-dimensional and the thoughts roll back in. Extend the breath a little bit further. Pay a little bit more attention. You're standing on a threshold of something 
important. See if you can open that gap wider and peer through that window, walk through that doorway and experience what it's like Because my creativity is beyond all affirmations and, neg and negations, I determine all events and meanings. This is as if your true nature is speaking. Because no objects exist which are not me, you are by beyond perspective or meditation. Because there does not exist any protection other than me, you are beyond charismatic activity to be sought. Because there is no state other than me, you are beyond stages to cultivate. Because in me there are from the beginning no obstacles, you are beyond all obstacles. Self arising, pristine awareness just is. Because I am unborn reality itself, you are beyond concepts of reality. Subtle reality just is. Because there is nowhere to go apart from me, one is beyond paths to traverse. Because all Buddhas, sentient beings, appearances, existences, environments, and inhabitants arise from the quintessential state of pure and total presence, one is beyond duality. And that's what it says behind me on the scroll. Out of not one thing arise the 10,000 things. Because self-arising pristine awareness is already established, one is beyond justifying it. The transmission of this great teaching provides a direct entry into understanding. Because all phenomena do not exist apart from me, one is beyond duality. I fashion everything. Relax the mind in that naked state of presence which exists when you are not caught up in whatever objects may appear. This is the fundamental teaching. This is what extending the out-breath does for us. Relax the mind in that naked state of presence which exists when you are not caught up in whatever objects may appear. Then there arises without any intellectual elaboration an ongoing lucidity which is not caught up in any appearances or concepts. This is the deep experience of creativity, the primordial freedom of mind itself. The primordial freedom of mind itself. And how to work with emotions that come up during practice. This is under the title of The Passions Are Intrinsically Freed. Though attachment, aversion, dullness, pride, and envy may arise, and you can put any of the emotions into that one, sadness, anger, irritation, upsetness, frustration, desire. Though attachment, aversion, dullness, pride, and envy may arise, fully understand their inner energy. Fully understand their inner energy, not their story, their inner energy, their sensation, that felt sense in your body. Recognize them in the very first moment before karma has been accumulated. In other words, before you're, you act out in frustration and in reactivity. Tune in. A difficult mind state comes up. Tune in. Feel the energy of that in your body. In the next moment, look nakedly at the state and relax in its presence. 
Look nakedly at the state and relax in its presence. And when you do that, when you are fully present with that sensation, there is no urge to, to react. Then, whichever of the five passions arise becomes a pure presence, freed in its own place without being eliminated. Right there in the middle of it, there's space. It emerges as a pristine awareness that is clear, pleasurable, and not conditioned by thought. It emerges as the pristine awareness that is clear, pleasurable, and not conditioned by thought. That is a, an extremely effective, profoundly effective way of working with obstacles that come up in our practice. And curiously enough, some decades ago in the field of psychology, a young graduate student named Eugene Genlin discovered the same thing, not within Buddhist context, but in exploring what made the difference in psychotherapy between people who could do years, even decades of psychotherapy, and still stay stuck in whatever their issues were. And yet there were other people who within the first three sessions would begin to transform and let go and move on. And he sought to find out what made the difference. And what made the difference? Presence. When a difficult mind state comes up, we usually try to avoid it, get rid of it, try to do anything to get rid of it. And there are lots of different ways that we can effectively um, push it back down under. But if we are willing to tune in as that feeling comes up, again, not into the story, but into the, what he termed the felt sense, and stay present with that, then just as it says in this ancient teaching, whatever it was that we were about to get caught in is released without having to be gotten rid of. And it does become the pristine awareness. Try it out. It makes a huge difference. There's often a learning curve, but when you get this practice down, it will help you move much more seamlessly through your Zen practice. And though I don't like to talk about progress, make progress much more readily. It also will make a difference in your daily life. Ultimately, our practice really is not about letting go emotions and feeling better. It's about f reconnecting with that ground of being and becoming truly, truly free. Truly free so that no matter what our circumstances are, no matter what our karma brings us in the rest of our life, we're not caught by it. We're free to relax in that pristine awareness. And out of that comes the ability to, well, it's not just the ability. The ability is always there, but uh, the, the path is cleared so that we can respond to life circumstances rather than react to them. And not only that, but it's felt far and wide. People even who don't know us experience this sense of peace and, and ease because that's, that's what's going on in our own mind. It makes a big difference. This is our bodhisattva work the work of coming to awakening for the benefit of all beings, not just for ourselves. And so, as we get closer to the end of the session, there's still quite a few hours left, but still, 
we're nearing the end. My deepest wish is that you continue and that you continue truly with great commitment. Nowadays, our Zen practice in the West <clears throat> is mainly with family and work, a life outside the temple, shoehorning in moments of practice, precious times when we actually can come to a sashin and practice together in an environment that is particularly conducive to practice. It's a more difficult way of practicing, but it also is one that will take you deep if you persist. I liken this to the difference between my experience at the Rochester Zen Center, and I, I can't imagine what it's like now because I haven't been there in more than 20 years. But in the old days in Rochester, when I was living there and training there, the environment was particularly set up so that there was as little distraction as possible from our practice. The windows were covered, so we didn't look out and see the views. We were admonished to keep our eyes down. There was absolutely no talking. In fact, uh, any, any communication that had to be taken was done in writing, which meant it was pretty limited, which had its benefits. If you're, if you're talking, it generates thoughts. There's, there's some positive things about that way. However, the downside is that uh, having created that sensory uh, deprivation, once we end Sashin and go out back out into our world, it, it can be quite unsettling. And uh, though we may have attained some level of depth during the Sashin, it's hard to maintain it once we get back in the midst of all that activity. When I went to train at Sogenji, I found things were not quite as strict in that sense. Uh, we didn't change rooms. We didn't close our eyes. We didn't, uh, well, you don't close your eyes anywhere in Zen practice. Um, you keep them open because it's important to uh, allow that possibility of integration with daily life to take place. But people talked. Uh, we weren't supposed to, but people did anyway. And what I discovered was that, that people, it took people longer to get as deep in their practice as they could get in a Sashin in Rochester, but it was solidly there. At the end of Sashin, they didn't, they didn't kind of lose their balance going back into society because there wasn't that much difference. At Sogenji, the, the different positions, if you were the head Tenzo or if you were the Tenzo of the day, especially if you were the Tenzo of the day, all day, that particular day, you were in the kitchen. You went first to Sunset in the morning and then immediately into the kitchen to get breakfast ready. And you had to, as well, during that time, answer the telephone and answer the doorbell. And so Genji was a pretty popular place. There were people coming from all over. It was, it's common in Japan to do spiritual pilgrimages. And you have a little book, and you go around to the various sites, the various temples, and you go up to the temple and you, you knock on the door. Uh, well, it's not a knock on the door. You usually hit the han or you ring the doorbell and the, the tenzo of the day comes out and uh, greets you and takes your book, if that's what it's about, and goes and gets the special Sogenji stamp and stamps your book and, and gives it back to you. But then there are often questions. Where's the ohaka, the, the, uh, the graveyard? Um, uh, and can I go up in the mountain? And various other things like that all of it in Japanese, by the way. And the Tenzo of the day is tasked with being the door person. 
being the secretary, answering the telephone, and getting the meal on, and going first to Sun Zen in the morning and first to Sun Zen in the evening, which means that their practice has to be kept going the whole time. On Sundays, there's a Zazen Kai where approximately 80 people from the local area come in to do Zazen and chanting. And the, the people who are the lead chanters, there's at least two and sometimes three of them, depending on how many people are in residence at the temple, they go out of the Sashin up to the Hondo and lead the chanting and interact with people. And when that Zazen Kai is done, they come back to the Zendo and continue their Sashin, except that their Sashin is really continued as a practice in the midst of activity when they're up there in the Zazen Kai, as it is with the daily Tenzo. There's a benefit to this. So those of you who, which basically everybody but me, uh, are in the Sashin and are going back to your daily life, uh, into family, friends, work, uh, into the outside environment, take your practice with you, but it's going to be transforming in a little bit different way. You're not going to be able to spend long hours sitting on the mat, extending the out-breath. However, when you can, you can do a single out-breath, fully engaged in, everything else let go for that brief moment. This is uh, something you can do at transition times. You're about to go to work, or you're about to come home from work. You're about to go to the bathroom. You're about to go to bed right after you wake up. There are many times in the day when there's a transition. And in that moment, just the few seconds it takes to do one extended out breath, not multitasking, not keeping in mind what you have to do next, but letting whatever you did last go and not yet engaging in anything next, but fully giving yourself to the extended out breath, it will make a difference. You'll be able to keep your practice going then. And then of course, if you're able to also put in half an hour, an hour, once or twice a day in the early morning or before you go to bed, so much the better. In this way, right in the midst of activity, in the middle of your daily life, your practice is going deeper. And then when you can, to take that week and go to Sashin and reinforce and deepen that level of practice. This is an extremely effective way to work towards awakening. And believe me, it is possible. There are plenty of people who in the midst of their daily life have had Kensho experiences. I think of Flora Courtois as a sophomore in college, University of Michigan, home on a vacation. Suddenly, a deep, very deep awakening experience because of all the questioning she had done in the year and a half which is when she got really serious about it, preceded by musings when she was even a teenager. This too is available to you. I know people to whom it's happened. Relax in that pure presence sink deep and search wordlessly for that ground of being, extending the out-breath and reaching, not for some picture of what a grounding be ground of being must be like, but with this openness to possibility. Keep it up and it'll open to you. I thank you for listening. We'll stop now and recite the four vows.